Okay, we're still trying to debug that. Um, so we're going to get started, however, um, and uh, we'll do our best to connect the live stream on the fly. So the first thing that uh, I want to do this morning is to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the call this morning. Um, it's uh, this is the first of the Lago Virgo Cabra webinar series um, that we hope to present uh, information about sort of our new discoveries as they come out. Um, the work of the LIGO, Virgo, and Cagra collaborations involves uh, thousands of scientists around the world. So as you know, it's, um, it's a huge effort and a lot of things go, come together to be able to take the data and then um, make the discoveries, the uh, first of which we're going to present today. And um, this morning, we're organized in a panel in which we're going to discuss GW uh, 190814, which was the detection of a merger of a 23 solar mass black hole and a 2.6 solar mass compact object. Um, without much more, I'm going to hand over to Vicky Calagera, and she's going to um, coordinate the presentation and then field questions at the end. You should be able to put questions in through the Q&A box on the panel. And if you do that, um, questions can also be upvoted by uh, attendees. And then um, Vicky will field those questions at the end to uh, members of the panel. So Vicky, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody around the world. Um, uh, we're very excited uh, today to be presenting our results uh, on the source of, of GW190814. Um, the publication uh, appeared um, in UPJ Letters uh, on Tuesday, and today we're happy to uh, uh, have the presentation. Uh, it's a team presentation and we're happy to also uh, take questions and answer them. We'll try and take as many as we can, uh, but I note that we have uh, 500 attendees, I believe 750 registered. So uh, I'll do my best to take as many questions as I can at the end. Um, in, uh, let me emphasize the uh, uh, practicality that please don't wait until the end to ask your question. So use the Q&A, as Patrick said, and write down your question. Uh, the whole audience can see your question and you can upvote. So the system automatically puts at the top the question that has the most interest, uh, let's say. So um, that will guide us once all the presentations are over. All right, so uh, uh, we have uh, a set of uh, experts representing our collaborations. Uh, let me start with um, our four speakers and introduce them in one go. We're not going to interrupt the presentation. So uh, we'll start with Laura Natal uh, from the University of Portsmouth, Charlie Hoy, Cardiff University, Phil Landry, California State University at Fullerton, Mario Spera uh, from the University of Padova, INFN in Padova, as well as Northwestern University. In addition to the speakers, we have three other experts um, who uh, also will be fielding questions. Uh, Jonathan Gare and Abiru Ghosh from Albert Einstein Max Planck Institute and Prayush Kumar from Cornell University. All right, so I think we're ready. Um, uh, without any more delay, uh, Laura, please take it away. Can I just check that everybody can see the slides now? Brilliant. OK. We can. And we can hear you. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. It's our pleasure today to talk to you about our latest exciting event, GW190814. So just. There we go. So just in case you haven't um, found a link yet to the paper, here it is um, to AppJ Letters with the title 
1908-14 gravitational waves from the coalescence of a 23 solar mass black hole with a 2.6 solar mass compact object. So just in case you're not familiar with gravitational waves, whenever an asymmetric object moves, it changes the curvature of space time. And this curvature travels at the, this change, sorry, travels at the speed of light and is known as a gravitational wave. So what you're seeing in the bottom right hand um, simulation here is our very first event, GW1908, so GW1509-14, a binary black hole merger. So what you can see with that video is that um, <clears throat> as the objects merge, they create an um, enormous amount of gravitational waves, which then propagate throughout the universe. And in the top right hand video, what you saw was the stretching and squeezing of these gravitational waves, very exaggerated, mind you, as they travel um, through the Earth. The colliding black holes and colliding neutron stars are some of the best detectable sources of gravitational waves for the LIGO and Virgo detectors. So just before we get to GW1908-14, where do we find ourselves um, right now? So back in 2016, we concluded the first observing run, which lasted for four months. And in, um, and in August 2017, we concluded the second observing run. Now, from both of these um, observation runs, we detected the merger of 10 binary black hole systems and one binary neutron star merger that you can see here in the left hand image. The y axis here is in solar masses. And so all of the blue dots here are showing you the binary black holes that we, um, the gravitational waves from the binary black hole mergers that um, LIGO and Virgo detected, um, and the orange. Um, Plots, points at the bottom show the binary neutron star merger, GW1708-17. Now, since then, we had our third observing run, which concluded in March of this year. And since um, that observing run concluded, we have also announced some other exciting events. GW1904-25, a likely binary neutron star um, merger, which is perhaps the heaviest binary neutron star merger system that we have ever seen. Um, as well, there's 1908-1904-12, which is the first observation of an unequal mass uh, binary black hole merger. So before I get to the event that we're talking about today, um, in addition to those events, we announced throughout the third observing run public events on the order of about 50 of these. So I've no doubt we've got more exciting things to tell you, but today we're going to talk about GW1908-14. So what was happening um, a, so what was happening around the time of this event? So if you look at the top right hand plot here, what you can see is if you like um, an image of the state of each of the three detectors on the day of the 14th of August, 2019. So on the X axis is the time in days and the different colors represent each different interferometer. A line, um, a, um, a straight um, horizontal line um, is showing you that the detector was offline. A box that is see-through and you can see the line is showing that the detector was in a nominal state, but not in the observing state. And the, um, and the box, which is um, a full color, is showing you that the detector was in what we call the observing state. This is the state that we like to be in to make astrophysical observations. So the black line is showing you the time of GW1908-14. And as you can see, the Livingston and Virgo detectors were both in their observing state. However, at the time, Hanford was out of their observing state, but in a nominal configuration because of commissioning activities that were taking place. However, at the time of 1908-14, or in a five minute window around this event, we verified that there was no commission activities were taking place. And so the data are usable from LIGO Hanford around this time period. So on the left hand side, what you're seeing here are spectrograms of um, each detector, Hanford on the top, Livingston in the middle, and Virgo on the bottom. And what we're seeing here is about a 10 minutes, 10 seconds, sorry, before the event. And on the y-axis is the frequency and um, the plot is colored by the normalized energy relative to that interferometer. So you can see the canonical chirp shape that we've come accustomed to seeing in detectors, in our gravitational wave detectors, as in the middle spectrogram here, LIGO Livingston. And if you squint, you may be able to see it in LIGO Hanford as well. Um, we verify that there's no evidence, um, instrumental or environmental otherwise, that could account for GW1908-14. So let's have a look at the timeline around this event. So it was detected on the 14th of August around 2110 UTC and very quickly.
Yes, hi everybody. It seems like we, um, can you hear me? Can somebody respond if you can hear me? Yes, uh, so, but it seems that we lost Laura. She is not connected anymore. So it's her connection. Uh, so we will wait until Laura can reconnect. Uh, let me, in the meantime, uh, let me uh, say the following. Um, uh, science questions, please submit them in the Q&A box. You will find it at the bottom right um, uh, of your, probably your Zoom screen, bottom to the right. Uh, if you click on it, a panel opens and there um, uh, you can submit questions. Um, I'm gonna be collecting them and then we'll answer them at the end. Um, please don't put science questions in the chat practical questions about sound dates etc those are all fine because when it comes to fielding questions about the science i'll be looking at the q a box thank you so much <clears throat> i can also say while we're waiting for laura maybe one uh, of our team members can get in contact with laura in case she continues to have trouble um, we have released data in association with this um, uh, discovery and I will try to give you the link. It's in, the, it's in our usual GWASC um, website. Richard, I know you had the link Ah, here it is. So you can see in the chat from Mike Zevin, the link is right there. Patrick, there is a question about uh, the live stream. I'm not connected to the live stream. Do you know if it's um, going or not? No, we seem to have some problems with that at the moment. We're still trying to debug to see if, it, if it's going. I think Vicky, I might suggest just given limitations on time for people okay. and so on, we probably should move to move through this the talk so yes the next speaker so, can pick up the last minute so Harley, can you share your screen with the slides and move on from uh the slide um laura was okay i can try I cannot be driving the slides and paying attention to questions. So if somebody can share the slides and Charlie, can you take over? Okay, slides are coming. There they are, Charlie. The first time we're doing this. Sorry about that. I was just loading up the slides. Um, oh, Laura is back. Laura? Hi there. I'm very, very sorry. There was a power okay. cut. I'm just, just pulling my phone. I will get going again. Uh, Charlie can share the slides and you can speak, okay? That sounds perfect. Thank you very much, Charlie. Charlie, Laura is on her phone now, so just share the slides, okay? Thank you so much. Laura, go ahead. Thanks very much, Charlie. If you could go back um, to slide six, that would be perfect. Perfect. 
Thank you very much. So apologies, everyone. So in the timeline around UW 1908-14, um, it was initially detected as a true detector event by the match filtering search GST LAL. Um, the reason it was a true detector event was previously explained in terms of that LIGO Hanford wasn't quite in its nominal, uh, it wasn't quite in observing um, state. However, very quickly, within 20 minutes, we issued a GCN um, with the blue sky, sky map that you see on the right hand side with the classification mass gap. So in the two hour period following that GCN um, notice, um, we went back and reanalyzed the data, including the LIGO Hanford data, because we knew it was um, fine to use in our analysis. And the match filtering searches, GSTLL and PyCBC, then refound the event um, with a single to noise ratio of 10.6 in Hanford, 21.6 in Livingston, and 4.5 in Virgo. Um, we then subsequently issued the GCN circular with the orange sky map that you see on the right, which is 38 square degrees. So following that, um, further analyses took place. Um, and then within about a 13 hour period, we um, managed to um, send another GCN circular with the green sky map on the right hand side, which is 23 square degrees and the updated classification of NSBH. And just so you're aware, the purple um, sky region that you see on the right hand side is our offline, or if you like, um, many weeks later, um, reanalysis of the data. So in issuing these various UCN circulars, there was a number of teams that went on to search for an electromagnetic or a neutrino counterpart. And um, to date, no such event has been, um, has been detected. And so if you'd like to go to the next slide, please, Charlie. Um, so there's no doubt that this event is extremely significant and with various analyses we can um, work out what the false alarm rate of this event is. So with using data of about a week around the event, match filtering search pipelines found that the event was, um, had a false alarm rate of less than one in 42,000 years and that GW1908-14 is the most significant event in the background. Model searches um, also estimates a false alarm rate of less than one in 1,000 years. So we have no doubt that GW1908-14 is astrophysical. And with that, I'd like to um, hand the floor to Charlie. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, on slide eight. So we used Bayesian inference on the data um, that was collected by the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors, and we were able to infer the source properties of GW1908-14. Now we actually found that GW1908-14 originated um, from the merger of two compact objects, a black hole of mass around 23.2 solar masses, and another object uh, of mass 2.59 solar masses. Now the uncertainties presented here and from now on are the 90% 90% symmetric credible intervals. Um, so they're the fifth and the 95th percentiles. Now GW1908-14 secondary object is, is really quite extraordinary. It's either the heaviest known neutron star or the lightest known black hole ever detected in a binary system. Now this asymmetric binary merged into a final black hole of mass 25.6 solar masses. GW1908-14 source is the most asymmetric merger that we've ever detected um, with a mass ratio which is defined as a secondary object's mass divided by the primary object's mass of around 0.11. Uh, GW1908-14 is therefore unlike any gravitational wave detection we've observed so far. So on this slide, we compare the properties inferred from GW1908-14 to the other gravitational wave detections observed so far to show just how exceptional this event is. So the left-hand plot shows the inferred secondary mass for nearly all of the detections from the first gravitational wave catalog, GWTC1. Uh, so this includes GW5914, 151012, et cetera. Um, and these events are all shown in gray. We also show the detections that we've already made in 03 including the first asymmetric mass ratio system observed, GW190412, which here is shown in green, and the second BNS merger that we've measured, GW190425, which here is shown in blue. And we see that the secondary object of GW190814 lies in a region of the parameter space where we currently haven't seen anything before. 
It lies in the region between the known neutron stars and the known black holes. Now the shaded region here shows the region of parameter space where the secondary mass is between 2.5 uh, and three solar masses. Now the right-hand plot again shows just how exceptional um, GW19814 source is. So here we show the symmetric mass ratio, total mass parameter space, um, with 2D contours showing the 90% confidence interval for all detection so far. For context, an equal mass ratio system is one with symmetric mass ratio equal to 0.25, and therefore eta must be less than or equal to 0.25. And a highly asymmetric mass ratio system um, would have a very small symmetric mass ratio approaching zero. Now the small blue region in this plot is the BNS region, defined as a region of parameter space where both um, mass one and mass two is greater than one but less than three solar masses. And the green region of parameter space is the binary black hole region, which is defined as a region of parameter space where um, the primary mass and secondary mass is greater than five solar masses. And you can see that all previous detections either clearly lie in the binary black hole region or the binary neutron star region. And the white region is left unexplored until now. This implies two things. Either our definition of the BBH region of parameter space needs to be extended to include GW190814, or we should actually add another region representing neutron star black hole binaries. Uh, so personally, I think this figure is really nice because it clearly shows that GW190814 source is the most asymmetric system that we've uh, ever discovered. Um, and it's completely different from anything we've seen before. But the question still remains, is the secondary object a neutron star or a black hole? And can we infer anything about the nature of the secondary using Bayesian inference? So if the secondary object is a neutron star, then unlike a black hole, this star could be stretched and squashed as a result of the gravitational field of the other compact object in the binary, akin to how um, oceans on Earth are raise, um, rise and lower as a result of the moon's gravitational field. Now this deformation leaves characteristic modulations in the observed gravitational waveform encoded by the tidal deformability parameter, um, which is here given by lambda two. For black holes, the tidal deformability is zero, implying that it cannot be stretched at all, and large lambda 2 implies that the neutron star is stiff, meaning that the neutron star holds its shape well and is therefore larger for a given mass. Now, as you can see here, if we assume the secondary object is a neutron star, then unlike GW170817 and GW190425, we recover a posterior which matches the prior, basically equal probability for all values of lambda 2. This therefore means that there is no information about tidal deformability of the secondary object in the data. And therefore it could either be a black hole with lambda two equals zero or a neutron star with any allowed lambda two. Now this lack of information is expected due to the large asymmetry in the masses. So we know that for any expected neutron star equation of state, the neutron star will merge before it's tidally disrupted, implying that the neutron star is just swallowed whole before it can be stretched and squashed. Um, <laughs> therefore, from our Bayesian inference, we don't know if this secondary object is a neutron star or a black hole. However, the data did allow us to place very strong constraints on the spin magnitude of the black hole, chi-1. We found that the spin on the black hole was constrained to be less than 0.07 at 90% probability, much smaller than any other spin magnitude inferred so far by gravitational wave measurements. On the left-hand side, we plot the posterior distribution for the primary spin magnitude for all binary black hole signals in GWTC1 plus GW190412. Now the horizontal lines here show the symmetric 90% credible intervals. Now it's clear that GW190814 is completely different from the other detections observed so far. On the right hand side, we plot the spin vectors for the primary and secondary object. Here the radius of the circle represents the spin magnitude and the orientation represents the tilt angle. Now a tilt angle of zero degrees implies that the spin vector is aligned with the orbital angular momentum, uh, so perpendicular to the orbital plane. 180 degrees implies that the spin vector is anti-aligned with the orbital angular momentum, and 90 degrees implies that the spin vector lies within the plane of the binary. Now as you can see by the left-hand side of this plot, we see high probability represented by dark shading for low spin magnitudes, but there is no preferred direction. Now the right-hand side of this plot is a different story, 
we see uniform shading in the whole of the plot. This means that both the spin magnitude and the spin orientation of the secondary object is unknown, and all areas have equal probability. Now, because this system has asymmetric masses, GW190814 allows us to test a fundamental property of gravitational waves. Now, according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravitational waves emitted from compact binaries are quadrupolar. This quadrupole radiation can be thought of as the main sound that's heard when you pluck a string on a violin. Now, just like musical instruments, gravitational waves should also have higher harmonics, ringing at higher frequencies of decrease in amplitudes. These subdominant multipoles scale with the mass ratio. So if the masses are asymmetric, then the significance of subdominant multipoles increases. As GW190412 was the first asymmetric mass ratio system that we observed, we found strong evidence for subdominant multipoles in the data. However, due to 190814 source being even more asymmetric than GW190412, we expect there is even more evidence for higher order multipoles in the data. Using the inferred properties um, of GW190814 source, we were able to calculate the orthogonal optimal SNR of each subdominant multipole. Now, amazingly, we found that the SNR from just the 3 3 subdominant multipole is approximately double what it was for GW190412 and is close to the total network SNR of GW151012. This makes GW190814 the event with the most significant evidence for higher order multipoles that we've ever detected. I'll now hand over to uh, Phil Landry, who will discuss some of the astrophysical implications. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so we're on slide 13 now. And uh, like Charlie explained, the fact that the mass ratio for this event is highly unequal means that we can detect higher order multipoles in the signal. The higher order multipoles help us break degeneracies between source parameters like distance versus inclination and get a really good handle on the source properties. The source properties in turn teach us something about the nature of the event and its astrophysical implications, which is what I'll be talking about. So first off, GW190814 enables tests of gravity in a new region of the parameter space for compact binaries, namely highly unequal mass ratios. In our analysis, we perform um, three different tests, null tests of general relativity. The first is um, a test for non kerr black hole spin-induced quadrupole moments um, in the waveform. The second is a test for deviations from a parameterized description of the in-spiral. And the third is a consistency test um, of residual data compared to noise uh, after we subtract off the highest likelihood waveform. All three of these tests reveal no departures from general relativity, validating Einstein's theory in this region of the parameter space. Um, the higher order multipoles in conjunction with information from all three detectors also give us a really tight localization of the source for these gravitational waves. In fact, GW190814 is the best localized gravitational wave event without an electromagnetic counterpart to date. Uh, that allows us to estimate the Hubble constant even though we don't uh, have any light associated with this event. So on the plot here, I'm showing the uh, possible host galaxies from the Glade catalog that fall within the 90% credible sky uh, localization vol volume for this event. And even though we don't know the true host, what we can do is associate the redshifts of every possible host in a statistical way with the gravitational waves, which give us a measurement of the distance to the source and therefore estimate H naught. We end up with uh, a number of 75 plus 59 minus 13, from this event by itself, from this dark siren by itself. And in combination with the standard siren, GW170817, uh, we update our gravitational wave measurement of H0, which remains consistent, but not yet competitive with the CMB measurement. Next slide, please. So we also get a really good handle on the component masses for this event. And we get a really precise measurement of the secondary mass, M2, which pegs it at 2.6 solar masses, uh, plus or minus about 0.1. Um, and let's see how that stacks up compared to other known compact objects. So on this schematic mass plot, I'm showing in yellow the heaviest known neutron star, weighing in at 2.1 solar masses. I'm also showing around five solar masses 
um, black holes discovered in electromagnetic surveys with secure mass measurements that put them at five solar masses and up. So it's clear that the secondary for GW190814 falls between these two populations. Um, it's either it's heavier than known neutron stars and it's lighter than known black holes. So it falls in this mass gap region in between where there are very few observations of compact objects. That doesn't mean it's completely without any company in this region. Um, we know of uh, a couple possible ways to populate the mass gap. Um, firstly, there's binary neutron star mergers. So for GW170817, that binary neutron star merger produced a remnant of about 2.7 solar masses, which is thought to be a black hole based on electromagnetic observations. That's quite comparable in mass to the secondary here and could potentially be su suggestive as one possible um, formation channel for this system. Uh, and then also there are electromagnetic surveys which have turned up black hole candidates with tentative mass measurements that put them in the mass gap. What's clear for, from this event though is that uh, the secondary is either the heaviest neutron star or the lightest black hole ever discovered in a, a compact binary with two compact objects. The question though is, is it more likely to be a black hole or is it a neutron star? Next slide, please. So the signal doesn't actually give us too much to go on to determine whether the secondary is a neutron star or a black hole. Um, there's no electromagnetic counterpart, and uh, there's we don't expect to see any tides in the signal. Um, and those would be normally our two sort of go-to uh, signatures of, of matter. Um, so really, we can only fall back on comparing the secondary mass, whose posterior distribution is shown in green here in this plot, um, to estimates of the maximum mass a neutron star can attain. We don't know that maximum mass exactly because there's uncertainty about the properties of neutron star matter, uh, about its equation of state, and uh, we don't know the neutron star mass distribution perfectly, especially in its upper reaches. So in our analysis, what we do is we compare M2 to three different kinds of estimate of the maximum mass. The first comes from studies of uh, the neutron star equation of state, and our modern equation of state knowledge puts the maximum mass below about 2.4 solar masses. So one example of a maximum mass posterior from these kinds of studies is shown in red here in the plot. That's taken from a spectral equation of state analysis of GW170817. And we can calculate the posterior probability that M2 is below this estimate of the maximum mass when we marginalize over the green M2 uncertainty and the red M max uncertainty, and we arrive at a number of just 3% for M2 being compatible with a neutron star for this comparison. Similarly, we can look at a comparison um, with the maximum mass estimated by studies of GW170817's remnant, which I alluded to earlier. So electromagnetic observations of this event uh, suggest that the merger remnant collapsed rather promptly to a black hole after a brief uh, supermassive or hypermassive neutron star stage where the star, the remnant was rotationally supported. And what we can do is map the threshold mass for collapse of that rotating remnant through the equation of state back to the maximum gravitational mass for a non-rotating neutron star. So different studies in the literature use slightly different prescriptions for that mapping, but they all arrive at a maximum mass bound that's below about 2.3 solar masses. And if you take that bound at face value, it's plotted as the solid gray line in the plot here, it's clear that M2 is in excess of this maximum mass estimate. Finally, um, we can also estimate the maximum mass without modeling the neutron star equation of state at all, just by looking at the population of galactic neutron stars, performing a fit for the mass distribution with the maximum mass parameter. So this kind of population form maximum mass estimate tends to have support up to higher masses, about three solar masses perhaps. But, um, next slide please. The, the key is that the bulk of the posterior probability for the maximum mass, even in, in this case, still lies below M2. So you can see this quite clearly on this joint distribution plot of the maximum mass along the x-axis, the secondary mass along the y-axis, with the dashed line um, dividing the black hole region. M2 is in excess of the maximum mass from the neutron star compatible region where M2 is below the maximum mass. And what you see is that 
all the shading, so the highest posterior probability density is firmly on the side um, of the black hole. So the takeaway from these comparisons is that um, the secondary in the system is more likely to be a very light black hole than a very heavy neutron star. Does that mean there's no way for it to be a neutron star? That's, that's not the case. I mean, you can think of scenarios that allow it to be a neutron star. They require maybe a little bit of special pleating, but for instance, if this maximum mass estimate from the population is biased because of selection effects, that could change things slightly. Um, or maybe you believe the secondary is rapidly rotating such that it can be slightly in excess of the maximum mass. But uh, the point is that based on our current equation of state knowledge and our current knowledge of the neutron star population, um, you know, this system looks like it's a binary black hole rather than a binary neutron star. Next slide, please. So it's pretty obvious that this compact binary merger doesn't look like the other mergers that LIGO and Virgo have detected before. You can see this quite clearly on the stellar graveyard plot, which was shown earlier in the talk. Now it's been updated to include 1908-14 right in the middle, highlighted in white. It doesn't look like the orange binary neutron star mergers, and it doesn't look like the blue binary black hole mergers. Um, a natural question we want to ask then is, how frequently do mergers like this occur in the universe? And so we estimate the astrophysical merger rate density for this new class of compact binary mergers based on one detection so far, knowledge of our survey time, and knowledge of our sensitive volume. And we arrive at a rate estimate of between one and 23 mergers per gigaparsec cube per year. So that's significantly lower than the binary neutron star rate. It's lower than the binary black hole rate, but it's not vanishingly small. So it's possible this is uh, the first glimpse of a population of mergers that's out there that we just didn't know was there. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Mario Spera, who will tell us more about the origin of this system. Yes, thanks, Phil. Hello, everyone. So in the following slides, I'm going to discuss uh, the possible formation channels and other astrophysical implications of the discovery of GW. 1908-14. So uh, Phil has already introduced this graphic and uh, he has already mentioned that GW 1908-14 folds into a unique region of this graphic and as such it has the potential to shed light on the formation of emerging compact object binaries with highly asymmetric masses. This also means that the discovery of GW 1908-14 might have crucial implications for astrophysics. Next slide, please. So uh, specifically, uh, the robust mass measurement that we have obtained for the secondary of GW 1908-14 may provide crucial constraints on compact object formation models. For instance, we know that uh, predicting the mass of black holes and neutron stars at, at formation, that is after the supernova explosion, is challenging. And not all models agree on the existence of the gray area we refer to as the lower mass gap. So this plot right here is an updated um, uh, adaptation of figure four of the LVC population paper from the O1 and O2 observing grants. The left-hand panel shows the compact object masses from gravitational wave detections, and the right-hand panel shows an example of compact object masses predicted by a number of astrophysical models that enforce the presence of the lower mass gap, which is represented here in the plot as the horizontal gray band between, say, two and five solar masses. The different curves represent different metallicities. Next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, GW1908-14 is quite different from the other gravitational wave events, also because the secondary falls right into the lower mass gap. Therefore, uh, this may, might point us towards the need to revise some of the prescriptions that we adopt in population synthesis simulations. However, 1908-14 uh, uh, challenges all current astrophysical models, not only those that enforce the presence of the lower mass gap. Next slide, please. 
And this happens uh, because uh, the real challenge here is not just to explain the mass of the secondary of 1908-14, but to explain the combination of masses, mass ratio, and the inferred merger rate that uh, we, uh, uh, we calculate, we estimated for this event. So also the parameter space, which is relevant for 1908-14, is still mostly unexplored from the astrophysical point of view, and all astrophysical models share the uncertainties on the nature of the secondary of 1908-14. Indeed, all astrophysical models do not distinguish a priori between neutron stars and black holes, so they use just a mass threshold parameter, which in most cases is in the range between two and three solar masses. And that is right where the secondary of 1908-14 falls into. This means that 1908-14 uh, like merger can be labeled either as a black, binary black hole merger or a neutron star black hole merger, depending on the adopted mass threshold in astrophysical models. Uh, next slide, please. So in population synthesis simulations of isolated binary systems, we know from the literature that most merging black holes have a mass ratio above 0.5, while most merging neutron star black hole have mass ratios above 0.15. So in general, isolated binary, uh, binaries, as far as we know, have the tendency to disfavor merging compact object binaries with highly asymmetric masses. Even though particular choices of a number of assumptions may increase the number of mergers with more asymmetric masses from this channel. Uh, however, uh, the parameter space which is relevant for 1908-14 is still to be fully explored. Another possibility to explore is, that, is the dynamical origin of the event. Uh, we know that dynamical interactions and exchanges are very frequent in dense stellar environments such as globular clusters, but we also know that dynamics tend to pair up uh, massive compact objects with similar masses. Um, so this is why for globular clusters, most merging binary black holes have mass ratios above 0.5. Furthermore, the formation of neutron star black hole binaries is highly suppressed in, uh, because the dynamics of globular clusters is dominated by black holes over their complete lifetime. So for this reason, we have robust predictions from this channel showing that the local merger rate density for neutron star black hole binaries is quite low and likely the merger rate for 0814 like systems is possibly much lower than 0.1 events per gigaparsec cube per year. So next slide, please. Um, several authors show that dynamical processes in young star clusters might enhance the number of progenitors leading to merging compact object binaries with more asymmetric masses. And they also show that the rates of either neutral star black hole or binary black hole mergers may be as high as 70 and 100 events per gigaparsec cube per year, respectively. So for these reasons, as we know from the current literature, young star clusters may bring the number of 1908-14 like mergers to relevant rates. However, um, even in this case, the parameter space which is relevant for uh, this event is still to be explored in detail. It's um, also been suggested that the secondary of 1908-14 is itself a remnant coming from a previous merger that can acquire a 23 solar mass black hole through dynamics in dense stellar environments. Though this might be unlikely in young star clusters and globular clusters, but other environments still have still to be investigated. Um, of course, a high spin of the secondary of 1908-14 would be a distinguishing feature for this formation scenario, but the uninformative spin posterior for the secondary of 1908-14 cannot either support or disprove this uh, formation channel. So next slide, please. Um, 
hierarchy are triples or quadruples in the field or in a galactic center may also play a crucial role and it is certainly an intriguing possibility uh, some others for instance uh, suggest that 19 or 8 14 like events may form from a low mass second generation remnant with mass around three solar masses merging with uh, a massive black hole around 30 solar masses catalyzed by a more massive black hole perturber, so in a quadruple system. Though, uh, to our knowledge the, of the current literature, it's not entirely clear if hierarchical systems generally favor the merger of systems with more asymmetric masses compared to those coming from, for example, from uh, the isolated binary channel. And um, merger rates for either binary black hole or neutron star black hole mergers are below a few per gigaparsec cube per year from the hierarchical channel and likely even lower for 0814 like systems. So it may be unlikely for this channel to be the main mechanism through which 190814 like systems form. Um, Disks of gas around supermassive black holes in active galactic nuclei may have chances to bring uh, 0814-like mergers to relevant rates. Uh, while th the rates relative specifically to this channel are quite sensitive to a number of uh, poorly constrained active galactic nuclei parameters, several authors show that the median mass ratio for neutral star black hole mergers ca can be as low as 0.7 and that merger rate density can be as high as 100 event per gigaparsec cube per year. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, we would like to stress one more time that 190814 is an exciting event that challenges all current astrophysical models. And the real challenge here is to explain the combination of its masses, mass ratio, and inferred merger rate, not just the mass of its secondary. Uh, while currently there might be some environments that can bring 0814-like mergers to relevant rates, the parameter space which is relevant for 0814 is still mostly unexplored by all astrophysical models and the latter make no conclusive predictions for merger rate of 0814 like systems for sure future gravitational wave observations of similar events will be crucial to better constrain our inferred merger rate and to also provide further insights into the dominance of different formation channels um, Thanks, and at this point, I would like to leave the mic to Vicky for a final summary. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. So we're concluding with uh, the key points. Um, we have uh, um, uh, the first time that we see a compact object with a mass at 2.6 solar masses. This is in a regime we often refer to as mass gap. Uh, it could be either way, whether it's a neutron star or a black hole, um, it would be a very interesting object. It's either the lightest black hole we've ever seen or the heaviest neutron star we've ever seen. I have measured the mass so uh, precisely. Uh, it is also the source with the most unequal mass ratio we have ever measured with gravitational waves. And um, it is uh, the tightest constraint. We, we are extracting the tightest constraint on the primary spin, the 23 solar mass black hole. Uh, the spin is, uh, the upper limit is uh, quite tight uh, below 0 0.0. Uh, seven of the maximal spin. So we're very excited about this system and what, um, uh, what will come out from um, uh, many studies of it. So I will thank you to the speakers, as I said, and thank you to all of you who have been submitting questions um, while the talk was going on. Um, Patrick, because we had some uh, delays in the beginning, I would like to preserve the 15 minutes of question, if you uh, agree. Um, uh, please let me know otherwise. But we're yeah, gonna let, let, let's proceed with that. Let's pause at the top of the hour to let anyone who wants to leave just 30 second okay. pause and or actually, yeah, okay, good. Thank you. All right, so uh, please click on your Q&A. You will see the upvotes. We have a, a, a top question uh, 
to be uh, taken, I'm gonna ask our, um, one of the speakers, Phil Landry, to take the question from Juan Garcia Belido. Okay, thanks Vicky. So this question is essentially getting at uh, why we didn't see any evidence of tides or tidal disruption in this signal. <laughs> So um, basically the reason for that is because the mass ratio is so extreme. Um, the tidal parameter that we're most sensitive to is this binary tidal deformability, lambda tilde, and it scales for a neutron star black hole with a small mass ratio, like the mass ratio to the fourth power. So that's gonna strongly suppress any tidal deformations. Um, the physical intuition for, for why that happens is just the scale of the secondary object is so small compared to the scale of, of the black hole that there's just no room for a gradient in the gravitational force to be set up across the smaller object. Um, in terms of the tidal, uh, sorry, in terms of the tidal disruption, um, what you do, what, what you find if you try and balance the tidal acceleration with the self-gravity of the secondary object, which we'll assume to be a neutron star here, and solve for the, the separation at which tidal disruption would occur, you find that it happens inside the black hole af after the plunge has already occurred. Um, basically, the tidal disruption would occur at about three neutron star radii separation, which is maybe 30 or 40 kilometers, and the black hole uh, Schwarzschild radius in this case is like 70 kilometers. So um, yeah, the, the answer is basically, because the mass ratio is so extreme, we don't expect any uh, tides or finite size effects in the signal. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, quickly to a, a related question uh, on this topic. So, Phil, please go ahead with the following. There's two questions that are uh, the same, basically, from uh, Chuck Horowitz and from La Yang Dai uh, about the um, uh, whether the equation of states uh, support uh, a 2.6 solar mass neutron star. Uh, and how does this connect to the deformability constraints we have for the merger of GW170817? Right, so that's, that's a good question. So if this uh, secondary is a neutron star, is there a way to sort of get it to fit with what we already know about the equation of state from gravitational waves? Um, GW170817 tells us that the equation of state has to be reasonably soft at a, you know, a couple times nuclear density because we didn't see very large tides in that event. Um, on the other hand, if the secondary is a neutron star, that would set the maximum mass for a neutron star to like 2.6 solar masses or so, which requires a lot of stiffness, a lot of uh, pressure gradients in the neutron star matter to just support the star against gra gravitational collapse for that mass. So is there a way to do both those things in the equation of state? Yes, there are ways to make that compatible. Um, is it, you know, is this one of the more likely uh, models going in for the equation of state? I would say no. But, um, you know, to speculate about one way to make that happen where you're softer in the equation of state at low densities and stiffer at higher densities is if you allow for a strong phase transition, then you can basically have two distinct re regimes of behavior. So if this turns out to be a neutron star, I would speculate that maybe that makes that hypothesis more likely, uh, but we don't know for sure. The, the net effect here is that, you know, um, if this were a neutron star, we'd have to pick out the equations of state um, that do this softening and then rapid stifting and high densities. Thank you, Phil. So let's move on to the next uh, top question uh, based on votes. So we have a question uh, about lensing uh, from John Antoniadis. How confident are we that this was not a lens event? Uh, Jonathan, would you please uh, take this one? Uh, yes. So there was another question asking about the possibility that gravitational wave events could be lensed. Um, and the answer to that is yes, uh, they can be lensed in the same way that EM sources can be. Uh, so in principle, you could have uh, multiple images of a gravitational wave event. So you'd see this a source that had very similar properties in the same location on the sky, uh, separated by some time interval. Um, but perhaps you might also see an event uh, that just looked like an isolated um, detection, which uh, had a higher amplitude um, because the, it has been magnified by the lensing effect um, than uh, it really does. So in that case, the 
the distance you infer will be smaller than it really is. Uh, this would lead you to infer a lower redshift. Um, and hence, when you convert from the observed mass uh, to source frame mass, you'd infer uh, a higher source frame mass than is really true. Um, so based on the gradation waves alone, we can't rule out that possibility for the GW 190814. It could be an event that is further away and has been lensed uh, and has lower source frame masses. Uh, the thing that uh, leads us to prefer the explanation that it uh, has the source frame mass that we think it has and is not lensed uh, is just the, uh, the probability in favor of uh, lensing is uh, low. We'd expect strong lensing to occur uh, with a probability of maybe 10 to the minus four. Um, so unless the rate of these events was much higher in the past, we would have expected to see uh, many similar events closer uh, before we see the first one that is lensed. Um, so the preference for it to be uh, a nearby event that is not lensed um, comes from this uh, astrophysical prior uh, rather than details of the signal itself. Okay, thank you Jonathan. So next question, um, Laura, uh, uh, please answer it. How much higher would the signal to noise ratio have been at Hanford if it would have been in full observing mode? Uh, the question is from Tony Pyra. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so there's actually um, no um, difference in terms of configuration or sense. Okay. Did we lose Laura again? <laughs> I, Laura, we cannot can hear you. you. Yes. Can you hear me now? Hear okay. Okay. Very sorry. Um, okay. So there's actually no um, sensitivity difference between nominal state and observing state. Um, quite simply, there is a button between those two states that says um, nobody is doing any commissioning work with the detector. So when, an so when the detector is an observing state, we can guarantee that there is nobody doing anything to the interferometers. So in terms of sensitivity, the, sen the SNR of the event would have been the exact same regardless of which state it was in. But if I could just have a little bit, um, what being an observing state does is bias time. So for instance, um, when we're in an observing state, all of the downstream analyses kick in automatically. So whereas it took us just over two hours to um, issue that sky map that was 38 square degrees because we folded in Hanford, um, if you like, by hand, had it been in observing mode automatically, we would have got out that um, sky map much, much quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next question. Um, how did the seemingly tiny chi -P solve the degeneracy between the mass ratio and chi effective? It would be very nice if we could see a two-dimensional PDF of Q and chi effective for both um, a higher multiples and precession higher multiples to see the power of the precession. This is an excellent suggestion for a uh, for a plot, uh, we, had a, a we have looked at this kind of plot. Uh, we had to make choices for what we put in the paper, especially because we were going to letters, although already the paper is very long. I will ask Charlie to address this question. Uh, yes, so that's a very, very good question. Um, so we know that there's not much power from precession, and this is shown in figure five in the paper where we calculate the SNR from precession. Um, however, we know that it will help break the degeneracy between mass ratio and chi effective. Um, and the reason for this is because the processing higher mode models can constrain chi p, but the non-processing um, waveform models cannot provide any information on the in-plane spin components. And it assumes um, that the spins are aligned with the orbital angular momentum. Um, so now, we, sh uh, so now um, we should note that measuring chi p equals zero is not necessarily the same as assuming um, that it's an aligned spin system. And this can be seen from the definition of chi p with the maximization. Um, so for example, in this case, for GW 19014, the data uh, is inconsistent with large chi p, but importantly, it's consistent with any secondary spin. So therefore, because of this inconsistency for large chi p, but consistent with any secondary spin, this limits the allowed values of chi effective that's, um, that is allowed from the data uh, for the processing signal models. And therefore the allowed Q chi effective parameter space is restricted, which helps to break the degeneracy. Um, so this is why we see tighter constraints on the mass ratio and consequently uh, the secondary mass for a processing higher mode signal versus a um, higher mode signal. 
Thank you, uh, Charlie. Uh, take a look at the next question. Um, uh, how sensitive is the estimated M2 uh, secondary mass? Depends on its uh, prior. Um, if we assume the prior corresponded to a neutron star, what would um, the secondary mass be? That's for you, Charlie, also. So when we did our analysis, we assumed priors which were uninformative. Um, we assumed a uniform prior on the chirp mass and the mass ratio, um, which, extended the, uh, which extended a large range of masses. Um, now this event actually peaked at a point where the prior on M2 was actually very small. So I don't think that it would be dependent on the prior that much. I think if we chose a different prior, it would still peak at roughly the same point um, because there's so much power in the, uh, so much uh, evidence in the data for this value of M2. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, okay, uh, a new one appeared, up, got upvoted. How do we explain that the uh, primary uh, has a, a chi one so close to zero from Juan Garcia Bellido? Uh, Mario, would you like to take this? Uh, sure. Um, so um, let's say that uh, theoretical models that predict birth spins for black holes are very, very uncertain. So some models predict high spins while some models do not, so we don't know. But as 1908-14, a non-spinning black hole of 23 solar masses may uh, be naturally explained by the collapse of a massive star with an initial mass larger than, say, uh, 30 solar masses. Uh, Black holes of this mass can form in principle at all metallicities, non-spinning. Uh, so th the main issue with spin comes from the fact that the physical processes that turn a massive star into a black hole are quite complex and we only have poor constraints on the efficiency, for example, of angular momentum uh, transport inside stars, especially during the very final evolutionary stage of massive stars. So s some recent uh, astroseismology models and uh, um, most black holes from the first and second LIGO Virgo observing runs seem to suggest that black holes may be born with low spins, but definitely we need more gravitational wave detections to either confirm or disprove uh, this uh, hypothesis. Also, uh, the latter may, may be in tension with some high spin, uh, high spin black holes found in, in mass X-ray binaries where, uh, uh, where the black hole mass can indeed be born, uh, be taken as a proxy of uh, the birth mass, so with high spins. So that's, that's a good question, but it, uh, it's very uncertain. Thank you, Mario. Next question um, uh, from uh, Paolo Cece. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the last name. Laura, could you take this? Yeah, absolutely. So Paolo asks, um, from what's shown in slide six, if the signal evidence has been obtained only or mainly from one over the three detectors, so we use all three detectors in our analyses, whether it's the search analyses or whether it's in parameter um, inference analyses. So all three, um, all three detectors, all three uh, data streams, if you like, played into our final, our final results. Livingston is um, the most, if you like, sensitive um, to this event um, with the highest SNR. So that does dominate, but all three are used. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next question. Um, uh, okay, they're switching. So, Jonathan, please take the Hubble uh, measurement question. Uh, yes. So, um, in the paper we quote, and in the slides we quoted two different uh, values for the Hubble constant. Uh, one was based on this event alone. Uh, the other combined this event with the uh, GW170817 uh, binary neutron star event. Uh, it is certainly true that by combining uh, more of the dark sirens, uh, you improve the constraint. Uh, that was not done in this paper because the, um, uh, we wanted to illustrate the power of uh, this one event on its own because it is the best localized. Uh, we are working on a combined constraint now, which is likely to improve a little bit. Uh, but at this point, the single DNS event with a counterpart uh, dominates the constraints anyway. 
Thank you, Jonathan. I would like to um, um, squeeze in at least one more question, and uh, that's for Abiru, uh, one of our other panelists. Uh, Abiru, uh, the, there is the question from Juan Garcia Belido uh, about the final mass of the merged black hole and the fraction of energy emitted in gravitational waves. Can you please take that? I hope you can hear me. Uh, so the question is, uh, is the final mass of the merged black hole and the fraction of energy emitted in gravitational waves consistent with it being uh, two black holes? So uh, the, the answer is yes. And um, sort of we, we did uh, some preliminary studies about checking the consistency between uh, the, the, the final mass uh, as sort of predicted using some uh, analytical relations to numerical relativity simulations from the initial masses, and then sort of trying to independently estimate uh, it from the, from the merger ring down part of the signal. And uh, as was kind of alluded uh, in, the, in the talk and previously in the presentation as well, uh, with this different uh, uh, a set of masses between the two companions, uh, even if uh, the secondary object uh, would not have been a black hole, the ultimate signature of the signal would have been remarkably similar to what we expect for a binary black hole event, and that indeed uh, is uh, the case here as well. So we, we don't see any deviations from uh, sort of expected behavior of uh, uh, binary black hole nature, uh, both in terms of the, the final mass predicted as well as the amount of energy emitted into gravitational waves. Okay, thank you, Abirup. Um, uh, I'm wondering whether we're past our 15 minutes. I can't, I, I, I would love to take more of the questions. I'm gonna ask Patrick if he'd like to go until 10, uh, 15 past the hour. Yeah, let's wrap it up in the next three minutes, Vicky. That sounds great. Okay. okay. So next question, uh, Phil, uh, could uh, the low mass component of the source uh, be a self-bound strange uh, star? Right, so that's a good question. Um, in our analysis, we only considered neutron star and black hole hypotheses. So uh, in principle, nothing we did can, you know, rules out exotic compact objects explicitly, as long as you can produce them, uh, you know, up to maximum masses in excess of 2.6 solar masses. So, uh, you know, exotic compact objects aren't necessarily ruled out. I think they're very unlikely uh, astrophysically, just from the sense of having a prior where we've already seen neutron stars and we've already seen black holes and we have some evidence for neutron stars or black holes you know, of these masses. Um, but uh, nothing we did specifically uh, in our analysis looked at exotic compact objects. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So next question, Mario. It's a long question, so I will not read it, uh, but it's from Mandeep Gill. So yes, basically uh, the answer to this question is that we have actually already have some good candidates for neutron star with masses between 2.1 and 3 solar masses. And um, uh, as a stellar evolution models, actually, uh, as I explained, it's very difficult for theoretical models to predict the mass and the nature of a compact object like neutron stars or black hole just after the supernova explosion. So they do not have actually predictive power uh, to discriminate and to distinguish between neutron stars and black holes. So what they do, basically astrophysical model, they just use a mass threshold to distinguish uh, neutron stars and black holes. So uh, also as stellar evolution models actually share this uncertainty on the, on the nature of the compact object. Thank you, Mario. Uh, the next question, actually, I will invite Patrick to address. It's a question from uh, Barak about uh, data that are not uh, officially in observing mode and whether um, they can be made available when data become available past the individual detections. Uh, thanks, Vicky, and thanks, Barak, for the question. So we're continuing to uh, look into our capabilities to release those, that type of data and expand our capabilities to release data. Um, it's just a matter of getting to it. Um, so, so that's actually under active consideration and I, I, I expect it to happen for any event but, that we release, but I, I just, right this minute, I don't have the exact status. So 
um, I'll have to check back on that and get back to you. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, I, I'm afraid at this point we should uh, close it up. Uh, I will say the following. A lot of the questions um, were answered in, uh, if you click to, instead of open to answered questions, they were answered in writing. Our colleague Prayush Kumar uh, has done a lot of the written answers there. Uh, I would recommend that the, we will stay online, not live, but we, oh, actually, I don't know. I was gonna say that we could try and answer all the questions in writing, but we can close the oral part of the presentation. But I don't know if this is at all possible, uh, Patrick, um, so. Our first time and given other glitches, <laughs> I have no idea. So. Yes, exactly. Um, so if you, if you are really interested in um, um, getting an answer, please don't hesitate to email Patrick and he will uh, forward it to um, whomever can answer the question, okay? Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, uh, apologies for some of the technical uh, glitches. Um, there's gonna be more in this series uh, and announcements will be made in due time. Thank you to all the speakers and uh, thanks for your attendance. Thanks everyone and thanks to the entire panel, that was excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye.